Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am joined by Deborah Grayson Regal, who is in New York City. How are you doing, Deborah? I'm doing great, thank you. And Deborah is a keynote speaker and consultant who teaches leadership communication for the Wharton Business School and Columbia Business School and a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, Psychology Today, Forbes, and Fast Company, and the author of Overcoming Overthinking, 36 Ways to Tame Anxiety for Work, School, and Life. Okay, and who doesn't want to overcome anxiety? We, we live, I think, in a very, obviously with the pandemic and stuff, it's been accentuated you know, significantly, but I think anyway, the modern world is very anxious. Everybody is very distracted. Everybody feels bombarded. They feel like they're overwhelmed and overloaded. And they think that they're working harder than they've ever worked or they're busier than they've ever been. I say they're more distracted, but that's my opinion. So, so Deborah, we're gonna talk about how to handle stress and anxiety in sales for you and your customers. So first of all, let's, let's just talk about what do you think causes a lot of the stress and anxiety that happens within a sales process from both the buyer side and the seller side? So I, I think you're in a, a dynamic here where if you are in a sales role, you are managing your own stressors, which could be uh, meeting sales targets, uh, reaching out to customers, uh, reaching out to customers who may not have any idea what their plans are, right? So you've got your own stressors that you are managing. And then assuming that you are a relationship building, relationship focused salesperson, you can't help but be impacted by the stress and the anxiety and the overwhelm that your clients and prospects are experiencing as well. So you're managing your own, you're probably managing some that come from your managers and direct reports, as well as the rest of your life. And if you're good at sales, you are empathetic, which means that you've got all of the stresses of your, of your clients as well. So how much, do you, how much of this stress do you think is self-inflicted? Say more about self-inflicted. I mean, how much of the stress, say, on the seller side do salespeople, like, put on themselves, you know, maybe by, you know, maybe not by planning properly, maybe not by, um, you know, following process or whatever. I think sometimes salespeople create some unnecessary stressors because, you know, they they maybe skip parts of the process or they don't do yeah. that call planning in the way they should. So I look at it a little bit differently than that, mm -hmm. right? So I think about, so the, the phrase that I'm hearing you use is unnecessary stressors. And I'm, I'm sort of interpreting that to mean preventable, right? Preventable mm -hmm. stressors, uh, things that could have been anticipated. And every single person, regardless of industry, has things that are, are preventable as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we have to keep in mind, whether uh, anxiety or stress is preventable or not preventable, is that as much as it costs us to feel uncomfortable, overwhelmed, and anxious, it also serves us, right? So when we are feeling overwhelmed and anxious, it is actually drawing our attention to something that's very important. And sometimes we have to rely on our body to signal us in a way that our, our uh, cognitive thinking hasn't caught up as well. So I wouldn't call any of the stress sort of unnecessary. Um, and one of the things that I, I often know is that when, when colleagues are trying to help other colleagues or clients with stress to call it unnecessary feels like it's minimizing their reality. So rather than look at it as unnecessary to look at what is your current behavior getting you and what is your current behavior costing you and mm -hmm. which path do you want to go down. So to put people in a position of choice. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 can, I, can, totally, I can totally buy into that. I think that there are things that 
um, or what I mean unnecessary, I mean, is that preventable to your point is yeah. I think there are things that are preventable, such as with good planning and also, you know, planning for multiple outcomes for a call as opposed to just planning for one, all of those good things. But let, let me touch on something else here. Uh, as you said, is, you know, good salespeople are, are, are empathetic. Therefore, when they get engaged with the client and they start understanding the client's issues and stuff, you know, that can become, um, you know, that can cause some stress and anxiousness or whatever is going. So how, how do, how can salespeople manage that? So, because sometimes maybe there is the temptation to, you know, become too, and rather to, rather than empathetic is to become sympathetic. Right. Yeah. And therefore mm -hmm. you suddenly start, um, you know, taking it uh, on, taking it on as yeah. opposed to, because sometimes with, because I think here's an th interesting thing about empathy. I think sometimes people think that empathy is me, agreeing and sympathizing with everything that's going on with you mm -hmm. as opposed to me understanding what's going on with yes. you and maybe sometimes that means i have to deliver hard messages yeah absolutely uh and i think you make an important distinction about you know empathy and and sympathy uh and and i think it's you know i i think it's that one of the differences that we have to take a look at is sort of Ongoing empathy that helps you be good in your sales role, right? It's important for you to be mindful that your customers and prospects are, are having an emotional experience mm -hmm. because we all are rather than letting that experience take you down the tube. And, uh, and I think that's, that's part of the, the distinction that you're making. If I were to sort of pull out for a second, I, I, I think a very important mindset to hold and understanding to hold is that emotions are data or data, depending on where in the world you are, right? <laughs> so emotions are data and that's no different than, you know, sales numbers, sales facts, sales statistics, which we tend to look at as our primary source in the sales world of, of data or data. Um, but emotions provide us with valuable information as well both for ourselves and in a sales role for our prospects and clients. So I often hear people say, you know, oh, somebody is emotional or isn't emotional. We're all emotional and we're all emotional all of the time. Some of us can access it more easily. Some of us have a more fluent vocabulary around it. Some of us are more visibly expressive. I'm somebody who is visibly expressive <laughs> around emotions. But if you are willing to treat your customer and prospects emotions as a as an information source and go into it rather than run away from it even if it feels overwhelming and scary you are going to build far stronger relationships and you are going to get information that you need about needs values and interests that uh are, are you know are immeasurable yeah you know i love that because um you're you're, you're absolutely correct and i do think sometimes people I mean, salespeople sometimes overlook the emotional impact that a buying decision has on the buyer or buyers. Um, I always say, okay, it's when you make a when you make a personal buying decision. Okay, if you get it wrong, yeah, it may cause you may have lost some money. It may cause you a little hassle or whatever. But it's not like you know, it doesn't it doesn't have a major impact outside of yourself. If you make an incorrect purchasing decision at a company, it can be career limiting. If you make a correct one, it can be career enhancing. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of emotion tied up. And I think sometimes salespeople forget that, especially as they get, especially at the beginning, because, you know, they're anxious to kind of push things forward. Absolutely. Right. So, and that goes back to your original question of what makes salespeople so stressed now, mm -hmm. which is managing your emotions, the emotions of your boss, your emotions of your <laughs> colleagues and direct reports and the emotions of your clients and prospects. That's a lot of emotional bandwidth that mm -hmm. you are expected to have. And one of the things that we know for ourselves and certainly true for our, our clients and prospects, if we're willing to consider them humans, uh, which I like to do <laughs> is that you know our, our the part of our brain where where fear sits is in battle with the part of our brain where where rational decision making problem solving and collaborating happen so the more we are driven by fear and anxiety the less able we are the less able we are to engage in problem solving rational thinking uh and collaborating 
And that's really important to know when you are asking a client or a prospect to make a buying decision that if they are scared, right? Scared mm -hmm. for their numbers, scared for their job, scared for things happening in their personal life, it's impacting their ability to make good rational decisions and to collaborate with you on a good outcome. So even just asking a, a prospect or client, hey, how are you? What's, I know we'll get to talking about business in a little bit, but how's your family? How are things going on for you? That's an incredible window into their ability to engage in rational thought. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I would add to that also, uh, you know, understanding from them, um, you know, the pressures that they may be under internally in the organization, you know, around this, uh, you know, it's just as simple as saying, I know making a buying decision can be a big deal. I'm sure there's people around you who are, who are watching and all of that kind of thing. And I'm going to help you through this process to help you make, you know, the best decision, whether it's to buy from me or not in the long run, you know, I'm going to help you with that. Um, I, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying there. I mean, I, I love the way you, you put it. Um, and I think sometimes when we do com get confronted with that emotional response, it can be very easy to get defensive and also almost to project, especially when a, when a sale maybe slows down for some reason, it's very easy to start to focus in on the buyer and it's all their fault and they're doing this instead of saying, okay, I need to probably dig a little deeper here. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's, there's more data to mine. Mm -hmm. And again, our instinct is to go with the numbers. I'm going to invite you to go with the data involved in somebody's emotion. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you've, if you've put in the time to build a good relationship with somebody, hopefully that will feel like a, a more comfortable conversation. So I, I think that's a, a really important element for us to keep in mind as well, you know, and, and one of the other things that when I do workshops for, for sales teams and sales leaders, one of the, the exercises that we, we go through is helping people uh, brainstorm a range of good outcomes in a sales call or a sales relationship. So when I went to coaching school, one of the phrases that I learned was the person who is most attached to a particular outcome has the most to lose. And as soon as I heard that, I thought about parenting, right? And I thought about any battle I'd ever had with my kids when they were little about what they were going to wear or what they were going to eat, right? Whoever was most attached to one specific outcome had the most to lose, and it was always me, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't care. And so when I work with sales teams and sales leaders, we spend a bunch of time thinking about other than buy from me now at the amount I want, what are other possible good outcomes? Yeah. And once they're willing to put that one outcome aside, it's amazing how they can come up with 20 or 30 good outcomes from a sales conversation that actually move the relationship forward. Yeah, and I think, and I just want to triple underline that because I think that's such an important point for people because yes, we do get very focused on a singular outcome. And kind of as I, as I alluded to earlier, it's one of the big mistakes that some salespeople make going into a sales call is to have one outcome only mm -hmm. in mind rather than to have a backup outcome or maybe even two or three backup outcomes so that you still feel like it, it was valuable in some respect. And I love what you're saying there is the fact about having outcomes for the whole engagement, you know, maybe different outcomes. Maybe it ends up being um, you don't get that piece of business, but you actually get a refer. Maybe you get, maybe you get greater insight into that industry and segment and you realize that your product or service doesn't fit that well there. Absolutely. And, and I actually, is, uh, so you're pointing exactly in the right direction. So maybe you get a referral. Maybe at this point you get somebody even to return an email after six months mm -hmm. of silence. <laughs> For me and my business, that's a victory, right? <laughs> to get a returned email because it means that the, that the, the conversation can continue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the greatest one of the greatest gifts that I think you can mine is if you get the gift of finding out what a no means, right? Does the yeah. no mean no, not now? No, not at that amount. Uh, no, because it's you, which I hope doesn't happen. But <laughs> even being able to find out, you know, what's inside of a no that you can use moving forward to, to get a yes down the road, that in my mind is one of many successful outcomes. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say, I, I, I love that, Deborah, because I do think that we sometimes think we just take the no 
and go, okay, but at least I know now that they're not interested and we move on and yeah. we just, you know, archive that and move on. Let's go to yeah. the next one and yeah. never, and never explore it. Yes. Sometimes it's hard to explore the no, because sometimes when people say no, they're not that interested in having any further conversation. Yeah. But to your point, if they are, I mean, that's incredible, incredible insight. Yes. And it requires you to pursue beyond the rejection, right? The, the feeling of hurt and rejection and disappointment and anxiety that comes with a no to ask somebody if they would be willing to give you feedback about mm -hmm. what that no means. And I'm, I'm really, look, I, I'm in a sales field as well, right? As a coach and a speaker, I'm constantly selling my services. And if somebody says no, I might try them one or two more times over a period of time, but I also want to be respectful uh, mm -hmm. of what of what a, a no means, and I tend to put the primacy of of a respectful relationship before anything else. Because for somebody, it may be a no for them, but it could be a yes for somebody in their network, and I've had that happen countless times. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think it is incredibly important how you exit. You know, even if it's a temporary exit or a permanent exit, how you exit an, an opportunity is very, very important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I think, and then I think also um, from from the buyer side. Unfortunately, I think uh, you know a lot of times I think buyers are not as considerate. They don't. I mean, even when they're salespeople themselves, right, or sales organizations, I don't think they're so often as considerate as they could be of salespeople. And, and sometimes, you know, I mean, you know, the just going silent or the, you know, or, you know, not returning, you know, being interested and then dropping everything. I mean, I just think there's a little bit of extra politeness or manners that would be great if we could reintroduce. I think that would take some stress out of the buyer seller relationship, too. Uh, yes, I'm going to give you a yes and from my background <laughs> in improv. So yes, I totally agree. I get very frustrated when I've been, you know, pursuing somebody and I don't get an email response mm -hmm. or, you know, or just sort of a curt no thank you. And I, you know, when I have to remind myself that more often than not, it probably has nothing to do with me, right? Mm -hmm. And if I can remind myself that they have a thousand other things on their plate. They have concerns that are beyond me. They have a whole life that is, is rich uh, with stresses and hopefully successes as well. And their no to me or their ignoring of me probably has very, very little to do with me. And that helps me manage, you know, what can feel like a very personal rejection. Uh, but it, mm. you know, it helps me move on and it helps me create, uh, you know, a good, um, a good pipeline. Yeah, but I just wish, I mean, this is a takeaway for people that when you are on the buyer side, uh, if, uh, if you're not interested or whatever, just, just say no. Yeah. Just yeah, say no, right. because otherwise, otherwise, yes, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of salespeople out there who then you know they're going to chase you, and then they're going whatever. So just right, just be right. My husband, my husband Michael had a consulting company for a while called Engineers Are People Too. So <laughs> salespeople are people too. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And we just tend sometimes to get very dismissive of that. Um, yeah, I, I totally yeah. agree. So um, what, what are some other areas that you think uh, we could look at from, from a sales point of view, maybe from a sales management point of view to reduce some of the stress? Yeah, so uh, I, I think before we reduce the stress, we, you know, two things. Number one is to take a look, as I said before, is, you know, what is it getting us and what is it costing yeah. us? And, mm -hmm. and I think that's such an important mindset because at the heart of it, we're all animals. Uh, and I don't mean that, you know, in, a, in an insulting way, we're all animals. And I can mm -hmm. tell you from living with a dog, my animal only does things that are in service of her, even if it winds up getting her in trouble. So when we are stressed out about something, the first thing we need to do is say, what, what is this getting me? So uh, Dr. Susan David, who is an expert on emotional intelligence, says that when you are having you know, what feels like a hard or negative emotion, you should ask yourself, what the funk? By, <laughs> and a reminder to ask yourself, what is the function of this emotion? Right? And so before <laughs> we start to think about how can I reduce the stress, you want to ask yourself, what is the stress reminding me to pay attention to? What is it reminding me that is important to me? Uh, what is it wanting me to look at that feels aligned with, with my values? 
Um, that being said, in order for managers to help their folks manage stress, one of the, the most helpful things you can do is to talk about your own, right? So create a little bit of vulnerability, a little bit of authenticity. Uh, you certainly don't have to, you know, bring it back to what happened to you in your childhood. You don't have to go back that far, but to talk about, you know, the fact that you get it too, you feel those stressors as well. Uh, but to do it in a way that doesn't make it all about you, but that demonstrates you can absolutely understand why somebody else would be feeling anxious and overwhelmed because you have been there yourself. Um, and I, I, my, in the book, Overcoming Overthinking, which by the way, I wrote with my teenage daughter, Sophie, you know, <laughs> one of the chapters that we, that we talk about, which I think is an important strategy is to figure out what kind of friend to be and what kind of friend you need. And in this case, I'll replace the word friend with manager. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I, I hope we're at least PG 13 here. Uh, but Good. So there's two kinds. There is a, we'll call it a manager, a sit in the shit manager and a pull you out of the poop manager. So sit in the shit manager is as the manager, when you are willing to be with your salespeople in their pain, in their fear, in their worry, say things like, oh, that does sound hard. It, you know, it must be so frustrating to follow up so much. I can see why you'd be nervous about your numbers you know, that does feel overwhelming. I can see how you would feel that way. That is a sit in the shit manager, somebody who's willing to be there with and for you. And then sometimes your role is to pull them out of the poop, which is, okay, I know that this has been a frustrating six months for you and let's think about how we can take action. What would be most helpful for me, for you? Do you want me to help you prioritize your client list? Do you want me to help you brainstorm ideas? Do you want to shadow me for a while? Uh, do you want me to, you know, send you some articles and podcasts that have been helpful to me? You mm -hmm. know, what do you need from me so that I can partner with you to move you along? And it's not binary. A good manager is able to go back and forth between sitting in the shit and pulling you out of the poop. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, I, I love that. And I love what you said, or, you know, um, what the funk, what is the function of this? That's, that's, that's brilliant. Uh, that's, that's really good for, I think, anybody to look at. Because, yeah, I think you have to look at the, you know, the functions of your stresses, the function of your emotions. And I do think you've got to separate, as you say, you've got to separate the ones that are serving maybe to keep you motivated, pushing you forward or keeping you on task. And those ones that are derailing you and are not serving you. Absolutely. So, so I'll just say, you know, for, for March and April of this year, as a speaker, all I did was watch my clients cancel mm -hmm. speaking yeah. engagements, right? That's all I did. And mm -hmm. I was sad, scared, overwhelmed. I started to think to myself, is this 2008 all over again? And when I thought about the function of my fear, it was really rooted in the value I have about providing for my family, uh, you know, the value I have around autonomy, right? If, if I can't generate client work, does that mean I'm going to have to go get a real job, like working for a person, <laughs> right? So it reminded me that I value autonomy. I value contribution to my family. Um, I value impact and being of service. And I wasn't getting to be of service. That was the funk of my funk. Mm, yeah, and I just and I think that's brilliant, and I think that's a fantastic way of looking at it, rather than just sort of going, throwing your hands up in the air and going, uh, "This is." Um, and, and I guess the other part of it, that's a difference between looking at your at yourself and and your real motivations as opposed to just thinking everything happens to you. Right. Yeah. I'm. I am not a big things happen to me. I mean, mm -hmm. they do, and sure. one of my great strengths is being resourceful and resilient. So I know that if things happen to me, I will probably take an emotional beating and then ultimately I will, you know, rise up like a phoenix. A little <laughs> less dramatically though, because I get hot. Uh, I'm at that stage <laughs> of my life where a phoenix rising from the ashes would make me very, very hot. But, uh, but yeah, I, I have a track record and I would invite, you know, all of you on this, you know, listening to this, I have a track record of bouncing back from a hundred percent of my setbacks, a hundred percent, right? I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm getting to speak with you. Right. Yeah. And so I would invite people to take a look at their track record of bouncing back from their worst days. And chances are it's better than they thought.
Yeah, I, I, lo I love that. And I love you brought that up because I really do think that sometimes people get so caught up in the moment and all of that, that they, that they don't look back and look back in a good way, not in a bad way, in a good way and say, yeah, you know, I mean, this didn't work at that time, but I managed to overcome that. And as you say, I am here where I am today because I'm a survivor, because I know how to bounce back. Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't. Uh, and, I, and I think that's it's a really important um, thing for people to do right now is to is to remind themselves of their own inherent resilience. Absolutely. So I think about it. I've been leading a lot of virtual workshops this summer uh, that are called Bounce Forward, right? Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. no back. We're, we're not going back to whatever it is. <laughs> we need to bounce forward and we're bouncing forward into a world that we can't even picture. And so because we can't rely on the landscape ahead of us, we have to rely on ourselves and double down on trusting ourselves and our skills and our, our resilience uh, and and not do, doing it alone and, and you know, relying on our, our network as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think just making sure that that network is, is the correct network mm -hmm. and that you're surrounding yourself by the right, right people and the Absolutely. people who, who motivate you and, and bring you forward. Not, uh, so because you say, if you're, if you're surrounded by a lot of people who look backwards and who see everything as an issue and all of that and doom and gloom, then probably you might want to think about reconfiguring your network. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say, as you start to think about your network, make sure that you've got people in that network who are willing to sit in the shit with you and pull you <laughs> out of the poop because you're going to need both. Right. And I know for myself, when I'm having a bad day, I do not call the pull me out of the poop friends. Like I can do that later. Right now I need somebody to say, Oh honey, that sounds terrible. And I go, I know, right. That's who I need. And so make sure both of those are in your network. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then just make sure that you understand what kind of person you are, whether you need that or whether you do need the person to just like say, come on. Get yep. Up. Yep. Absolutely. We need, all of us need all kinds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Listen, this has been fantastic, Deborah. I'm, I'm so grateful for you joining us this morning. My pleasure. Um, all of Deborah's information will be in her bio below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and your business. Absolutely. So I am a uh, leadership consultant, executive coach, speaker, and author. My area of expertise is around uh, communication and presentation skills. So uh, whether that's for salespeople or it, for specific industry professionals, and I've taught courses on management and leadership communication at Wharton Business School, Columbia Business School, and the Beijing International MBA program at Peking University. And what I really love to do is to work with leaders and teams to help them communicate more effectively, whether that is presentation skills, navigating conflict, giving and receiving feedback, coaching conversations, or probably most importantly, how we can change the way that we communicate to ourselves within our own heads. Fantastic. And as you can see from the interview, I mean, deborah has got some fantastic ideas and uh, delivers them with passion and enthusiasm, which, uh, no, which I love. And I think we need more of that. I mean, positive passion and enthusiasm. I think that's an, an antidote to a lot of the stuff that's uh, going on right now. All right, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM CEO for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. <laughs>